Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this very exciting webinar on to cloud or not to cloud. I am Sangeeta, Senior Marketing Manager for Jade Global, and I will be moderating today's session. We will open the question and answer session later on for any questions you may have. So feel free to type them into the chat area, and we will try to address as many as we can. All right. Uh, now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our company. Uh, Jade Global is an Oracle Platinum Cloud Standard Partner. We are into advisory, integration, testing, cloud and consulting services, business solutions, and IT outsourcing. We are headquartered in San Jose, California, with offices in Philadelphia, San Diego, Atlanta, Reading in UK, and Pune, Noida, and Hyderabad in India. For more information, please visit our website, jadeglobal.com. So on this webinar, we have Mohan Ayer from Jade Global. Mohan leads the finance practice in the enterprise application group at Jade Global and has been working with Oracle applications since the early 90s. He has an accounting background and has led multiple implementations of various EBS versions in upgrades and new implementations. His focus is business process assessments, improvement, and end-to-end -end process automation. I'll hand it over to Mohan now, who will take you through the agenda and present today's session. Over to you, Mohan. Thank you, Sangeeta. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, wanted to uh, take some time before we start to get a background about what we're talking about. We've been hearing about cloud for a long time, and there's been a push in the last several years to move um, a lot of applications and functions from automation to billing to collaboration to the cloud. And one of the things that is topmost in most people's mind is whether we should take the step now, wait, or think about when to start moving. One of the things I'd like to do as part of this presentation is walk you through some of the milestones that have happened in <clears throat> the general cloud arena, and then take you through a couple of applications and also delve on how Oracle has moved to the cloud, and then take you walk you through some of the options of the advantages and disadvantages of moving to cloud and see and start a conversation which will probably help make the move or at least make the decision that helps you uh, understand what the criteria is to make the make the call to move to the cloud or not. Uh, like Sangeeta said, um, we, we will have a question and answer session at the end, so feel free to type in your questions in the chat box and uh, we'll try and, and respond to them at the end of the session. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at the background of computers, they've been available for quite a long time. In the early 60s is when actual computing as, as a topic became available. And it, at this point, if you look back, it's pretty strange when you think about how computers were at that point of time. There were large behemoths which act, actually would occupy most of a large room, and there were specific set of people who needed to operate it. You actually had to have special cards to enter those rooms where the computers were. People would actually generate reports and have to bring it to you to your desk. It was kind of a back office operation where it is almost like facilities where somebody used to do some task for you and get it to you at the end of the task. It was not something which was interactive. It was not something which was focused by a person doing their job on their own. Um, look at the fact about 20 years later, uh, or 25 years later, where in the early 80s, you actually got introduced to what was called as personal computers. These personal computers were something which was used by a single person, and that's why the terminology personal, and it probably sat on your desk, occupied probably half of your desk, or a little more, depending on how your computer was placed, and you would actually be able to use that yourself. You would probably still have to go to a different location to get, get your printouts and your reports, but you could do a bunch of stuff on your own, see results on the screen, uh, and get your reports in a normal way where you would be the driver to get that. But for some large enterprises, in addition to these PCs, you actually also had the large behemoths, which were called mainframe computers, which did, still did sit in rooms back in you know in the facilities area 
probably where a lot of the computing happened, um, financial systems, HR systems, operational systems, all happened there. You still needed to have um, skilled personnel or specific people with skills to operate those, but then you had a you had a balance between some people having worked on a PC and some of the people where large computing was required have to still continue to work on the mainframe. <clears throat> In the early 90s to mid 90s, we actually had a change where a lot of people started to get even smaller computers called laptops and mini computers. And the computers started to get smaller and smaller. And you reach the stage now where actually whatever computing capabilities and capacity you had on those large computers in the early 80s on your desktop are actually available uh, in a palm size uh, widget which allows you to do almost the same things that you did then almost everything that you did then soon things moved and cloud computing became a strategy that a lot of people started to move and in the late 90s um, early two, 2000s people started offering um, what was called as cloud computing capacity, which a lot of people could use, which meant that you could actually not have a computer at hand, but have a, a device, which could be your laptop or your phone or your uh, tablet, which you could then plug into something that was available on the on the cloud in the in, uh, in the Ethernet, and you would actually be able to do most of the work that you needed to do. That started to kind of get the cloud um, train up and uh, up and moving and at that time cloud was here to stay a lot of things were still being done on premise in your in your offices um, you still had personal computers on a lot of people's t desktops um, but you also had the cap capability and the capacity to start working with a mobile device in your hand with with functionality with environments in the cloud <clears throat> So coming back to what it would have looked like before the cloud came into place, you actually had an expensive set of infrastructure which needed to be able to manage your machines, your infrastructure, your um, cables, et cetera, and everything else that needed to make the computers work. You also needed a lot of electricity. You needed air conditioning in a large um, set of cases. And if you look at this, the, the diagram on the right-hand side, that probably looked like a landscape that a small to medium company had um, to be able to start using computers and computing um, in the general sense of the word. What did that mean? What that meant was now you had expensive machines sitting um, in an expensive real estate, taking up space, and you also had um, a lot of supporting mechanisms around that people other infrastructure which allowed that to be humming smoothly most companies that did business their main focus was not managing or keeping the computers humming that was not their main focus so it took away focus from your actual job of maybe setting a solution or setting a product second it added capital cost you had to um, sink some cost into buying the infrastructure, keeping it up and running, keeping the people available to make sure that it was running, and it also added operational cost. Um, people, um, power to make it kept up and running, um, other people to maybe manage to make sure that it, it kept humming as you expected it to. And the focus, like I said, was, was diverted from your core business. Not that everybody that was working on that was not working on selling a product, but there was a, a component of your business which was not core to what you, what we're doing. So it was not your core business that was that was being managed by these uh, additional tasks and, and costs. What happens on a cloud environment? Um, <clears throat> when you have a non-cloud environment, there are still a few functions which are maybe not that familiar with being done from the cloud. As an example, there needs to be something on your hand to actually access the cloud. But then also, it turns out to be that you have some things that will eventually work with the cloud, but you need some infrastructure in-house or on the ground to make it happen. Document scanning is an example. Uh, barcoding is another example. 
processes which are low and, and automation. So in, in the sense that you do need to have a scanning mechanism here, a, a lot of things have changed over the last few years and you actually can technically send an email to a fixed email account which would then take on the task of actually scanning the document that you sent and putting it into a, in, into a digital form that you could review. Now, it hasn't been that phenomenally successful, but it's, it's evolving and it's getting better. These would actually require you, some of these tasks would require you to have some infrastructure in-house, like bar barcode scanners. Um, you would need, you, you, you can technically do barcode scanning nowadays with, an, with a mobile phone, but some of the other things probably need you to have a specific device. So th those things will still continue till it evolves into a process by which you can actually manage to get that completely devoid of using a specific device, be able to do it on a mobile phone. So those things will add an involved cost, which will not go away for some time. Uh, they are reducing on the cost, but it, it's still there. There's going to be some initial cost, and there's also going to be some cost, which is uh, upkeep and, and stuff like that. What is the evolution of the cloud? I think if you look back over the past few years, maybe a decade or more, the first true and real cloud uh, application or, or function that was covered by a product, which was Salesforce.com. I think before that, there may have been small uh, or, or, or minimal cloud environment or functionalities or products available, but Salesforce was one of the bigger um, players to come into the market and actually completely changed the way a lot of people did their uh, opportunities and quotes and did their pure uh, customer facing and quoting process. Uh, there were other companies that followed suit, but it did not become uh, a real true uh, engagement that people started to offer and proliferate probably in the early 2000s. Today, actually, if you look at it, there are a lot of companies that offer cloud solutions. And by cloud solutions, you mean all you need to do is log onto a website, you actually get a URL, you sign up for a subscription service, which is how most of these um, facilities and most of these functionalities are made available, and you pay month by month, and that's all you need. You only need a single device, and maybe that's your laptop, maybe that's your tablet, or even your, your um, mobile phone. And here are a few notable names that you would be able to relate with. Uh, Salesforce.com, obviously, is one of them, NetSuite, Amazon Web Services, Zora, Coupa. They provide different services, different functions. As an example, Salesforce and NetSuite are focused on specific areas. So is Zora and Coupa. But Amazon Web Services is actually not a specific function or a business function that it provides. It actually provides you a platform to do whatever you want. And, and, and that is also proliferating. So in the last probably five to six years, Salesforce has gone ahead in leaps and bounds, and so has Amazon Web Services. They offer functionalities that provide you services that are completely disparate, but they're all on the cloud. You do not need to invest in hardware. You do not need to invest in people to support it. All you need is an account, and you need to pay a monthly subscription fee, and somebody else takes care of it, so you don't have an overhead. Um, what's the history of the cloud? If you look through this, this pictorial, it kind of gives you to, to a large extent how um, computing and cloud computing became a norm. So till about 99, like I said, Salesforce was the first one that came out. It was all something that people had to have in in-house to, to work on it. There were some things that came up in the 90s, which is which we could call as virtualization software in 70s and 80s, which allowed you to actually have multiple scenarios on a single physical um, server or a box. But till Salesforce came along in 1999 or late 90s, cloud computing was not something which was generally talked about. Since Salesforce has come, I think almost a multitude of companies have just walked through and tried to move on to the cloud, including large companies like SAP, Oracle, um, and any other company. Today, you can actually look at the cloud as a service and offer that and offerings of subscriptions are available for um, your expenses, your collaboration, your email, uh, and almost everything else. Plus, you have other things which are 
completely on the uh, on the cloud like services like twitter like uh, instagram which are not business focused um services but are also things which a lot of people are doing uh from from doing by using for collaboration so if you if you step back and look at what functions and what services are available on the cloud for an enterprise um, you see that on the left hand side of the slide <clears throat> box.com concur google apps netsuite amazon web services adobe uh, webex office 365 these are all cloud services there was a time when you were actually having to get a cd to be able to install microsoft office and use it on your laptop uh, even though nowadays a lot of people do adhere to downloading and installing software on their laptop they don't need to you actually have all of these uh, all of the office suite well i should say most of the office suite available on the cloud you don't necessarily need to have a laptop and a hard disk to download that and install it those are some of the enterprise wide apps if you look at personal cloud computing you have a platform you have an architecture and you have an application you do not need to be aware of any of this as a user as a consumer all you need to do is you look at the application from your laptop or from your mobile uh, device and you log on to that the platform and the infrastructure which are the backbone of this are invisible to you all you see is an interactive ui which is part of the application and you use it you don't need to do the upkeep of the application you do not need to worry about there being any issues because if you are having an issue you obviously have a channel to reach out to the support group to do that but mind you there would be other people who've seen and had that um, same issue and it becomes important for the person who's providing you that application or the service to have that fixed quickly because otherwise thousands of people are going to have the same problem so that's another benefit of moving to the cloud is the resolution times have got to be changed to be as much as within the hour or even less to be able to make sure that the user experience is not compromised. Uh, here is an example, and, and this is actually a salesforce.com um, uh, dashboard. Here's an example of what you could see on a cloud-based environment. It doesn't mean that you can't have that on a on-premise or something that you have in-house, but the time to build that and the input that you get from people is going to be a lot more um, disparate, and you moving this from being static to dynamic will take time and it'll take time for you to make the change whereas if it's on the cloud there is so much input from so many numbers of people who are using it that changes on this based on feedback are a lot more faster uh, most companies actually provide you uh, at least two if not more upgrades to their functionality to additional new features to uh, user interface changes because there's so many people using it and there's so much feedback. So it, most companies have at least two in a year, if not more, of updates. A lot of people, a lot of companies also have quarterly updates. Uh, that they, they decide and depends on how mature that software is, decides what you will get, whether you will get just small tweaks or you will get major enhancements on major functionality. So it also becomes easier for you from the perspective of usage because it's more intuitive it's a lot more easier and better to look at <clears throat> so coming back to the to what a lot of people use um, a lot of people use like i said salesforce.com there's also one of the things which is an erp dilemma there have been multiple erps enterprise um, software resource planning software which have been in the market the leaders have been obviously sap peoplesoft oracle and a few others like JD Edwards and the challenge always has been that they anybody who is using an ERP software has had a challenge of not being able to use a single solution for their complete business there is a lot of push from most of the large companies to use a single software but there are so many differences and nuances in the way businesses happens in the real world that one single solution does not meet the requirements of most people so they have never been singular. There have always been multiple systems which have been integrated to be able to form what you can look at as data sharing. Also, there has been no single company which has been able to provide a fully covered solution which allows for a business to 
come up and come up and start to run and say this one company is providing a solution for me and it has everything that I need. So two other things happen. You have a large headcount to manage different infrastructure, different software, different integration needs. So think of it back before the cloud. You had one box which had your ERP software, another box which had your HR software, another box which had your billing software, the fourth box which had your uh, customer uh, integration software, quotes, and, and, and stuff like that. So that was one overhead that you needed to have multiple areas, multiple boxes. So there's infrastructure which was, which was you know, all over the place. Then you had those software that had to be maintained. You had to actually have somebody who manages that, looks at what issues were coming up, and make sure that this working smoothly. And then you had the challenge of integrating all of this together because data is always shared. There's never data that's in an island. There's never a person who works in, a, in an island me mechanism. So you had to share data. You had to share processes. You had to share results. So you also need integration needs. What happened was a lot of people started to build their integrations, build their support logistics because they had all of this. They had people who understood one aspect of this solution, brought in somebody else who understood a different aspect of that solution, and then they both talked work together to build an integration. So integration mechanisms and integration platforms proliferated. You had so many of them. If you look at, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at a particular integration mechanism, and there is nothing wrong with this slide. It is a by choice kind of grayed out because there's a lot of integration. It's a gray area. A lot of people could not fathom the number of touch points and the complexity that, that happened to be in this case. If you look at how integration works, this was what it looked like. You had multiple systems, multiple integration platforms, multiple integration methods, methodologies, and multiple integration data points, touch points. So it was like almost like a web. And what would happen if you wanted to come onto a single platform or you started to use something which was cloud-based? You still need had the integration needs. You still had to have um, data points, you still had to have data sharing. Now, as we had talked about before, we are an e um, Oracle partner and we've been working a lot with the ERP solutions e-business suite. So just to give you a, a very quick summary of where we are with the ERP software and especially Oracle's ERP software. Uh, the, the latest version which is on premise and which is non-cloud is ERP uh, release 12. Um, it's called eBusiness Suite Release 12. It was released in 2007. And prior to that, there was a, a release called 11i. And that was released sometime in the early 2000s. Currently, Oracle has released a Cloud ERP, which is a similar functionality which has been available in the eBusiness Suite, but has moved to the cloud. Uh, cloud ERP was released in 2011. It was called Fusion Applications then. Now it's, been, uh, it's changed to be called Cloud ERP. Um, they had CRM first, which is your, your what Salesforce.com generally provides to the market and has mostly, I think, 90 or plus, 90 per percentage or more of the market. Then it's followed by SCM, which is HR, and then it's followed by ERP, which is financials, manufacturing, order fulfillment, and all that. Um, the initial versions were still in controlled release, and the way that they were done was very few people had access to it. One of the first commercially available um, versions was release four. Uh, the current release is release 11, and uh, actually release 12 has become available. It will become available with a patch in the middle of this year. Um, it also releases a confusion because release 12 on cloud and release 12 on premise have the same numbering or same sequence or, or, or how you want to call it, versioning. So there's a confusion about that as well, and so, now, Oracle has provided, so has SAP, and so has Workday. All of these are now purely cloud-based solutions. The business or the users have not moved entirely to the cloud. They are still on-premise. They're still having some systems which are working within their existing infrastructure. This is how the look and feel of the current ERP looks like in EBS. And what happens when you move to the cloud? 
just to give you a basis on where we are and what it will look like in the future, you saw what Salesforce looks like, you saw what EBS on the on the on premise looks like. But what do you do you gain by moving to the cloud? You actually gain a modern technology stack. Remember that if you were on premise, you had servers, you had boxes, you had integration mechani mechanisms. Upgrading that to a more modern platform involves time, involves resources, involves money. And it's always a challenge to plan around when is the appropriate time to do that. All of that goes away when you have function functionality on the cloud because it is always up to date. There is somebody else making sure that it is current. You actually always are on the current version and, and patching. All of that does not need to be worked out. In most cloud applications, on a regular basis, like I said, either on, on a quarterly basis or a monthly basis, you have regular patches which fix issues, which fix uh, problems that they have seen at other places, gets updated. On a regular basis, probably quarterly or biannually, you actually have upgrades which move you from one point version to the next. And you also have a simpler user interface, uh, and it's based on open standards. Uh, look at NetSuite, look at Salesforce.com. The user interfaces are completely different from what you saw from on-premise systems. And that's primarily because their user interfaces are based on more economically uh, available real estate on, this, on the screen, on your devices, and it changes based on what device you're using. It'll be different on your laptop or desktop. It'll be different on your tablet or mobile phone. And integration is also based on open architecture, so the integration becomes a little easier. You do have to follow some certain standards, but it becomes a lot more easier. And in the past, you actually had reporting, which was more of an IT function. In these cases, when it's on the cloud, they have it has to move to become a lot more user-focused. And the reason for that is now you do not need anybody or that many people to manage your IT infrastructure or your IT software. So all of that has gone out of your realm and from your office. So there are lesser number of people who are in IT focused on support. And so what happens is they, they become analysts, analysts or they become business analysts who will help you utilize the software more efficiently and with more benefits to you. So there is also a change in the way the, the user interacts with the, with the system. Here is a cloud look and feel. Now, this is still, some of the screens that I'm showing you are still what, what you see in Oracle applications. So if you're not using Oracle application, this may not be that familiar, but this is how it looks like. And it's more akin to what you saw in Salesforce than what you saw in the eBusiness R12 screen that I showed you some time back. Here's again some other um, facets of how, the, how, how it looks. So, like I said, you would also lose some functionality or lose some aspects of what you could do when you move to the cloud. You've seen, and I've talked through what you, what you gain. Um, you are current, you are more based on open standards, uh, it's more user-focused user on the way you do it, but now you have some things that you might lose. And the fact is, it's not that you would lose it because you will not you'll not be able to do something, but it, you, you, in the sense that you will lose the capability to do customizations, extensions. And it, it, it behooves you to move to a more standard uh, processing uh, accompaniment with us, or how other companies are doing. The older technologies had harder uh, support components. So you actually needed to have a lot of people to support that hardware-wise. You also had multiple systems that were used for, for m different functions. So it meant that one user had to probably learn multiple user interfaces. When you had different systems sitting for different things and it was not based on um, standards and open interfaces, the way you interacted with the system would entirely depend upon how this person who built the uh, software thought that it would be easier for other people to use. Um, you would actually lose the capability to customize. The reason why people customized was because they didn't like what they were using and everybody had a different way of working with the business solution that they were providing. So you would absolutely lose the customization capability. Now, there is a slight difference in the terminology. You can still extend cloud 
applications and cloud platforms, you cannot change the way in which they dynamically work or uniquely work in their own sense. The reporting challenges in a system which is on-premise, in-house, and not on the cloud, reporting was always a challenge. If you ask anybody who's been using legacy systems, their biggest challenge has been being up to date and being current from the IT perspective and reporting in access to data that they have captured from the perspective of what a user uh, perceives. So these have been the major um, uh, problems that have happened when you've not been on the cloud, when you've not followed standard uh, processes, when you've not followed open standards. Infrastructure, hardware, and software upkeep has also been a big problem. And then you look at companies which are in the similar business areas or, or, or similar industries, and they have uniquely different business processes. Most business processes are based on at least a handful of tenets of how businesses should work. But because you had the capability to do what you wanted to do, a lot of people just completely created unique different business processes. That also led to support being a challenge. So if you move from one company to the other, how you did your job in company A would be completely different in company B. And that is not to say that they are not completely different companies and they should not have differences, but the basic tenet of how a business process works like selling, like accounting, like AP, AR, how do I fulfill? The basic premise would be the same. How you would approach it how you would actually fulfill it, the mechanics and the technology of that would change, but the process at the end of the day would remain the same. You would need an AP invoice. You would need to pay that AP invoice. You need to have a sales order. You would need to ship some product or widget which was on the sales order. That does not change. But how you build that product, how you get that product to the customer, how you build your pricing in a sales order, all of those things can change. But the basic tenet of having a sales order, fulfilling it, and giving the customer what, what they need will not change. So the basic tenet still remains the same. How you achieve that will differ. And that's where the challenge of having standard business processes with tweaks to allow for your mechanics to work differently is allowable, and that makes the business be able to approach this in a more efficient manner. So the cloud look and feel. So again, coming back, this is what an entry screen looks like on the non-cloud environment in, in Oracle applications. And the reason I'm using this as an example is primarily because I have access to this and I easily can show you the differences between one and the other. I don't have access to much of the other systems which have a flavor of on-premise as well as on the cloud. And if you look on the right-hand side at the bottom, that's how the same screen looks like on the cloud. It's completely different and it's built based on open standards. You have you have um, buttons at specific spaces, you have how it looks like it's more cleaner, it's more open, not in a specific um, method in which it's been in the past. Um, what happens from the perspective of being on-premise on our on cloud? And here are some aspects. Um, on-premise, the focus happens to be on IT, how they start the process and how they manage the process, because it's all dependent on how the solution can be built on an existing system and hardware that you have. On the cloud, that moves to user focus, because the user is the driver, and you don't need a lot of IT help to actually implement the system. It's become a lot more easier. It's, been, it's become a lot more user focused, so you actually can make changes to configurations, et cetera. That was not the case on-premise, because it was a a legacy system, not very many users were interacting with it other than for using and entering data, but now it becomes, well, if you go on the cloud, that becomes, that changes. And ID owns and makes changes to the system and business provides requirements. That's the other tenet or anomaly where you had legacy systems. And on the other hand, on the cloud, business owns the process. They can actually define the configurations. They can change it. There may still be some aspect of the configurations which might still be done by either an implementation partner or IT as you start deploying the cloud processes. But in most cases, uh, a lot of the ongoing configuration can be done by the user. 
um, IT manages a lot of specific skills for data and reporting needs. The data needs to be captured, data needs to be massaged, data needs to be uh, plugged in, and then reporting needs to needs to be done on that is all done based on something that you give to IT, they do something, and then they get back something to you after a point in time. When you move to the cloud, that has completely changed. Reporting is a user function and is it in real time. You actually have inbuilt BI and you have inbuilt analytics, so you don't really need to wait for you to get to the report. It's already available with your data on a real-time basis. Um, one of the things that you have when you have an on-premise system is you have the capability to have as many environments that you have uh, other than production. So your production system is the one that actually drives your business and you have a copy of that to figure out what is the problem, to figure out enhancements, to figure out some development needs that are going through. But on the cloud, that isn't the case. Every non-prod instance, you can get as many as you want, but you will need to pay for every one of them because it's on the cloud. Somebody is actually managing and monitoring how much space you use, how much of bandwidth you use, how much of uh, terabytes you use of space. So it's going to be an additional cost, as many number of additional uh, environments that you need. And the, the last one is, if you had an on-premise system, everybody built their processes based on what their capabilities were and what they knew at that time. When you move to the cloud, one of the major differences that you will see is that the cloud functionality and the cloud design is based on best business practices mapped to modern processes. So you do have the option to tweak that a little bit, but the basis always remains the same. Like I said, an AP invoice is generated, it's paid. That happens to be the perfect process for an AP functional area. And that does not change whether you're in company A or company B. The same way people take an order, they build that product that they're supposed to be on that order and they give it to the customer and then they fulfill the order by shipping it to the customer. Again, the basic tenet of ordering, building and shipping remains the same. If it doesn't involve building it, then the fulfillment or the shipping remains the same. How you get to that level may differ, but the business practice that you talk about always remain the same. So the, the building blocks of each function will remain same throughout most of the industries, but the way you manage that, or there may be some slight coordination or sequencing that may be different, but on the basis of the larger picture, most of those things remain the same. So you can actually build and design systems around a common user interface, a common integration platform, a common set of steps that you would perform to run your business. In summary, uh, there is no right answer or that is clear decision. It's always based on your individual need as a business. And you also have the challenge of knowing which particular functions or functionalities or business areas are mature enough for you to move off into the cloud. There are complexities that you have in your business, which may never be on the cloud because it's very specific to your company, to your kind of business that you're doing. And <clears throat> it is surely possible that there are some things that you cannot move to the cloud. Let's take an example of financials. Any company who has financials, GL, AP, AR, fixed assets, procurement, this is the same regardless of where you go. You get an invoice in AP and you pay it. You get an invoice in AR, and you receive payment on that. So finance is probably the easiest to actually manage to move to the cloud because the functions remain the same 90% of the time from business to business. I would even rate it more than 90%, but being on the conservative side, maybe 90 to 95% is, is good enough. But if you have a complex manufacturing or distribution function in your enterprise, then the answer may not be that easy because the manufacturing and the distribution function that you have is so typical to your business that the cloud may not have that as a solution and it may not be mature enough to reach that stage for some more time to come. And here is a, a, an example. If you have very specific process-oriented manufacturing mechanisms, the cloud at, at this point is not ready for you. So you probably have to wait a little longer, but your finance functions can move. And if your finance functions and your distribution functions or manufacturing functions are so closely integrated that they cannot be separated, then the choice for you to move to the cloud becomes a lot more difficult than any other company which probably has just, you know, they have a product which is a subscription service on the cloud themselves 
and all somebody needs to do is download something or just connect. For them, it's very easy to move the cloud. Everything is financial. It's a subscription-based uh, billing mechanism, and you're ready to go. So here are a few that probably would be easier to move to the cloud. Finance, HCM, which is HR or human capital management, sales. These are a few which are probably a lot more easier to move to the cloud than uh, a manufacturing or a distribution function, which is very, very specific to your area of expertise or your industry. Thank you very much for attending the webinar. If you have any questions or want to know more about our solutions and services, then please email us at marketing at jglobal.com. We'll help out with any query you have.